When most people see rust, they see damage. They see neglect. They see something that has already lost its value. But beneath the surface of the earth, rust is not a sign of loss. It is a signal, a chemical message written slowly by water, oxygen, pressure, and time. A message that geologists, miners, and serious prospectors have learned to read with precision because rust does not appear randomly. It forms where reactions are active, where minerals are breaking down, and where something deeper is happening beneath the rock. And in certain geological environments, rust is not the end of a process. It is the beginning. Long before gold is seen, long before quartz veins are exposed, long before any metal reaches the surface, oxidation begins its quiet work. Iron reacts, sulfur shifts, invisible fluids move through fractures that most eyes never notice. What rises to the surface is rust. What stays below is often far more valuable. This is why experienced field geologists do not dismiss rust-stained rocks. They stop. They look closer. They ask a different question. Not, why is this rock damaged? But what process created this pattern? Because rust patterns are not uniform. They spread in halos. They follow fractures. They bleed downward. They stain certain rocks and ignore others entirely, and every one of those behaviors carries information. In arid regions, where rain is rare and surface erosion is slow, rust becomes even more meaningful. Oxidation there is not constantly washed away. It accumulates. It records history. A rust-stained outcrop in a desert is often a long-exposed window into subsurface chemistry. It shows where fluids once traveled upward from depth, carrying dissolved metals with them. It reveals fault zones, shear zones, and ancient hydrothermal pathways that no modern map clearly shows. This is why some of the richest gold systems in the world were first identified not by gold itself, but by iron oxides at the surface. Gold, unlike iron, does not rust. It does not oxidize. It survives intact while everything around it breaks down. But gold rarely travels alone. It is often carried by hot, mineral-rich fluids rising from deep within the crust. Those fluids interact with iron-bearing minerals along the way. They alter them. They destabilize them. When those systems collapse and cool, iron minerals oxidize near the surface. Gold remains behind, trapped in veins, fractures, and chemically favorable zones. What you see on the surface is rust. What you don't see yet is the system that created it. This is where most people make their first mistake. They treat rust as contamination. They treat it as surface noise. But in geology, surface features are rarely noise. They are compressed summaries of deeper processes. A wide rust halo often indicates prolonged fluid flow. A sharp rust boundary may point to a structural control. Patchy, mottled rust patterns can signal brecciated rock where fluids once surged violently through broken stone. These are not random stains. They are maps, and once you learn how to read them, you begin to realize something important. Gold is not evenly distributed in the earth. Neither is rust. They cluster. They follow rules. They respond to structure, chemistry, and time. In many gold-bearing regions, iron sulfide minerals like pyrite form deep underground alongside gold. When erosion exposes those rocks to air and water, Pyrite breaks down, it oxidizes, it produces iron oxides, rust, and acidic fluids. Those fluids may dissolve surrounding minerals, enlarge fractures, and even free microscopic gold particles that were once locked inside sulfides. In some cases, rust zones mark areas where gold has already been liberated and reconcentrated just below the surface. 
In others, they mark the weathered cap above deeper, untouched ore. This distinction matters because not all rust means gold, but almost all significant gold systems leave some kind of oxidation footprint. This is why serious prospectors do not chase shiny colors alone. They chase context. They ask whether the rust is aligned with regional structures. They check whether it follows a fault or shear zone. They observe whether quartz is present, whether the rock fabric is fractured, whether the rust penetrates deeply or only coats the surface. They understand that rust is not the prize. It is the invitation. And this is where geology quietly intersects with wealth. In financial markets, most people react to surface signals. They chase headlines. They respond to price movement. But long-term wealth is rarely built by reacting to what is obvious. It is built by understanding systems beneath the surface. Gold, both as a metal and as an asset, rewards patience and structure. It forms slowly. It concentrates quietly. It reveals itself only to those who understand process, not appearance. Rust patterns work the same way. They are slow signals. They do not scream. They whisper. And those whispers have guided generations of geologists toward discoveries that reshaped regions, economies, and lives. In the American West, Countless gold systems were first traced by iron-stained ridges cutting across otherwise ordinary terrain. In Nevada, Arizona, and parts of California, oxidation zones stretching hundreds of meters wide marked buried systems that would later become major producers. In these places, rust was not the end of value. It was proof that value had passed through. And once you begin to see rust this way, you stop ignoring certain rocks. You stop walking past certain outcrops. You stop dismissing what looks ugly, broken, or worn. Instead, you begin asking better questions. Why does the rust thicken here? Why does it fade there? Why does it follow this line but stop abruptly at that boundary? Those questions lead downward. And downward is where gold lives. This is not about romantic treasure hunting. It is about reading physical evidence left behind by natural systems far more powerful than any machine. Oxidation is chemistry in motion. Rust is its signature. And beneath that signature, in the right geological setting, lies a story of pressure, heat, fluid flow, and concentration that can turn ordinary looking ground into extraordinary value. In the next phase of the story, we move deeper from surface stains to subsurface traps, from rust patterns to the exact conditions that determine whether gold stayed, moved or concentrated. Because rust is never the answer by itself, but when read correctly, it tells you exactly where to look next. Once rust has drawn your attention, the real work begins beneath the surface because oxidation is only the visible ceiling of a much deeper system. Below that stained rock lies the zone where chemistry, pressure, and structure decide whether gold is scattered or trapped. As iron minerals oxidize near the surface, they create what geologists call an oxidation cap. This cap acts like a historical record but it also plays an active role. It changes permeability. It redirects groundwater. It creates chemical gradients that influence where metals can move and where they must stop. Gold does not dissolve easily, but it can be transported in microscopic form when conditions are right. Slight changes in acidity, temperature, or fluid pressure can cause gold to drop out of solution suddenly, often just below the oxidized zone. This is why many gold deposits are found not at the rust itself, but directly beneath it. The rust marks where the system breathed, the gold marks where the system collapsed. 
In fractured rock, oxidation follows pathways created long before rust ever appeared. Faults, shear zones, embrasured corridors become highways for fluids rising from depth. These same pathways later guide oxygen and water downward during weathering. When both movements align in the same structures, concentration happens. This is the quiet rule of geology. Where fluids move repeatedly through the same channels, value accumulates. Rust patterns help reveal those channels. A vertical rust streak cutting through otherwise clean rock often signals a fault or fracture that reaches deep into the crust. A broad rust zone with soft, crumbly textures may indicate altered rock where minerals have been chemically stripped away, leaving space for gold to settle. Hard angular quartz fragments embedded in rust-stained ground tell a different story. They suggest violent fracturing, rapid pressure release, and sudden mineral deposition. The exact conditions under which gold is often forced out of solution. These details matter because gold is not evenly spread even within a deposit. It pools, it traps, it hides in specific physical and chemical environments, and rust helps narrow the search. In desert environments, this relationship becomes even clearer. Low rainfall preserves oxidation features for long periods of time. What you see today may reflect processes that occurred tens of thousands or even millions of years ago. A rust-stained ridge in a desert is not recent damage. It is a geological memory. That memory tells you where fluids once moved upward, where heat was released, where pressure dropped, and where metals were forced to make a decision, move on or stay behind. Gold almost always chooses to stay. This is why experienced prospectors pay close attention to the transition zones, where red fades into yellow, where hard rock becomes crumbly, where quartz veins pinch, split, or abruptly terminate. Those are not random boundaries. They are chemical and physical thresholds, and thresholds are where concentration happens. What looks like decay to the untrained eye is often refinement in progress. Nature stripping away everything that does not belong, leaving behind what cannot be destroyed. Gold survives oxidation. Gold survives pressure. Gold survives time. That resilience is not just geological, it is economic. Because the same qualities that keep gold intact beneath rust-stained rock are the qualities that have kept it valuable through centuries of financial systems, currency changes, and market cycles. Gold does not rely on trust. It does not rely on performance promises. It relies on scarcity and physical reality. And geology is the mechanism that enforces that scarcity. Understanding rust patterns is not just about finding metal. It is about understanding how value forms quietly, invisibly, and over long periods. Most wealth is not created in moments of excitement. It is created in systems that work slowly and predictably beneath the surface. Gold-bearing systems follow rules. They reward patience. They punish shortcuts. Rust is the surface expression of those rules. When you learn to read it correctly, you stop chasing randomness. You start following structure. You stop hoping for luck. You start trusting process. And that shift changes everything because once you understand that rust is not decay, but direction, you begin to see the ground differently. You recognize that some places have already done most of the work for you, that nature has already concentrated value, quietly, precisely, and without urgency. All that remains is the understanding to recognize it. Gold is not loud. It does not advertise. It waits. And rust, for those who know how to listen, is one of the clearest ways it speaks.